Hi, welcome back to Brooks's Base Corner. Today I have part one of a two-part interview for you with Mr. Cool himself, Mr. Nathan East. This interview dates back to May 2017 when he was here in London performing with Eric Clapton at the Royal Albert Hall. He's in fine form, as you'll hear. If you enjoy the interview, please hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell so you get notifications when I post up new videos, and please give the interview a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. I'll come back to you as soon as I can. On with the interview. Enjoy. What came across to me watching the show is that the band seems like a bunch of friends who just so happened to have turned up at the Albert Hall and could have a bit of a play. And yeah. uh, lo and behold, three and a half thousand people have turned up to watch. Exactly. It doesn't feel like a big production. It doesn't feel like a massive deal to you guys. I know it is, but coming off or sitting where we were and watching what's going on the stage, it's just like a bunch of friends. Yeah. Is that, is think, that how it is? I think you're spot on in your diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at this stage in the game, you know, in, in Eric's seventh decade of life, yeah. you know, you wouldn't really, okay, we're going to produce a big show, get the dancers and the, mm. and the lights. I mean, so, so for us, I mean, we rehearsed out at uh, Cranley Art Center, uh, Performing Arts Center, which is a beautiful, it's about just a little bit bigger mm. than this room and has these little seats up there. And it felt like, I mean, those were the most enjoyable rehearsals I've ever wow. experienced, only because you're not in SIR or Bray, you know, I'll do respect, but you're not in this big kind of um, rehearsal, production facility. Production facility. facility. Yeah. It, was just, it was just a very, and we just, you know, we sat next to each other and it just felt like making music with friends, you know. And and so then you get into the Albert and it's the same thing only you just have to, you have yeah. an audience. Because it's like we were you. totally focused on watching you guys and then Martin said look to your left and he did like a panoramic photo and suddenly you've got all the people that are watching. It's like the two don't correlate but the audience yeah. now I think Eric's audience are of such an age and they respect what he has to deliver. So yeah. rather than them all going Wah! making an absolute noise. They're very yeah. happy to sit there and listen to the nuance of yeah. the band. You know, you're not having to play, you know, 140 decibels. It's yeah. It seems like it's all a very, very much a comfort thing for you guys. Is that yes. Right. Yes, and and it's it's like a relationship that grows. You know, you're not necessarily having to be in the honeymoon phase yeah. every single time. You know, so there's no expectation for them to get up and scream and said, I'll play this and that. You know, I mean, they, they know they're going to get classics and you're going to hear Wonderful Tonight and, yeah. and all these, you know, Tears in Heaven, which, which you know, if, I, if I'm in the audience watching a Clapton concert, every single song, I don't care how many times I've heard it or what it is, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is just part of, uh, you know, rock and roll royalty. It's like a library of music. Exactly. I mean, and spanning so many decades. Yeah that you know so you, it's always fun to look in the audience and see young and then you know medium you know small medium large yes <laughs> <laughs> i mean in front of us was bernie eccleston really yeah so come on right in front of us yeah no kidding yeah, I, i've martin sent me a picture and i've deleted it but he was sat right in front of us oh, and we wow. were like okay we're in the posh seats tonight wow. <laughs> behave us behave don't exactly. get too uh, but i mean i was watching the interplay between you and steve gadd and it's like a pair of naughty schoolboys. That's what <laughs> right. it, it's, it is. It's like, because he did something on one of the songs and he went bang and you went. Exactly. And he went. Right. Exactly. As though, it, not that it was a rehearsal thing, but he, maybe it was something he'd intimated no, in rehearsals. He, he, I, I'd, I'd need a chiropractor if I had to turn around every time he did some brilliant move like that, you know. But every now and then it's just like, come on, I got you, you know. <laughs> and, and yeah, little little smoke signals get yeah. sent across the stage. He, he's. He's just, a, again, the finest, most mature, um, most, uh, his instincts are the best hmm. of, of just about anybody you, you could ever play with. Because he's got quite a, long, well, being that close, I can watch what he's doing, he's got quite a individual way of playing. Right. He's not one of these, t like, you see certain drummers and it's all like, 
it's all as though they've practiced it a million times and that's how their body moves. But right. Steve, the way he does it, it's very unique to him. Yeah. If, if he taught someone to play like him, most teachers would go... I think so. it's economics, you know, mm. like, like, a, like a tennis or squash player, you know, you, you don't want to use all your energy that's running and ripping and running so that the older the guys, you, you know, they, they'll stand in one place and run you around the court, you know, <laughs> so they, they've worked out a way to to economy of energy, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's what, um, that's that's the wisdom of, of a guy like Steve Gadd that's been yeah. playing, you know. Yeah. Um, so what is it like to play in Eric's band? You're it's, the man who's there, so. I tell you what, it's 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 one of the highest honors that you can you can imagine in terms of um, in terms of the quality of the music, the importance of the music. You know, it's it's not just a gig, and at this point, there's almost a, a, there's a feeling of a family um, having you know. It's over 30 years de- now. Yeah, exactly. And decades ago, we uh, we were out at the house the other night. And I was there, you know, decades ago. Yeah. And it's just, it's amazing to me to think, um, and, and he's, you know, he, he's just as gentle, gentle and kind and mild-mannered, but he's one of the biggest really icons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, iconic yeah. with, with regard to, you know, so it's, it's always still a, a sort of a pinch me moment when, yeah. you're, when you're there. So when you first got the call, would that have been 86 or were you on one of the albums As before? a matter of fact, uh, b- before Behind the Sun was 83. 83. Yeah. So was that, uh, you were called in as a session player by the producer or was it Eric personally said, I want Nathan? Well, it was the, at that point, he didn't really know all the LA session right. guys personally. So it had was, a few it, rough years before. It'd be exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was sort of a getting to know you because Steve Lukather was there, Jeff Beccaro, Michael O'Marty and Greg Fillingaines, yeah. you know, all the L.A., um, you know, heavy guns that the Warner's producers yeah. called. And so when Eric came, he's meeting us, we're meeting him, and everybody was the, the huge mutual admiration society. Yeah. And, um, and then later, Eric and I, you know, we kept bumping into each other. Phil introduced me to him at the pub out in yep. Guilford, when we were doing that Philip Bailey's album, yep. you know, then there was Live Aid, and Eric stood on the side of the stage and and, and invited me, you know, for a little hang after. Yeah. The show. So then it started to be more of a personal, yeah, um, you know, brotherhood. Cool. Um, does his gig require a certain approach and a certain headspace from you? Because I can't imagine this gig is anything like doing Toto or you know certain other big bands. But Eric's thing is very watching how you were playing and listening to what you were playing it's an like Steve Gadd it's an economy of motion thing you weren't having to be flash it's, it's basically this is what I need to produce as the bass player he's the star but it, it wasn't like you were really sort of digging in it was more of a comfort way of playing yeah I think um, at, at this stage in the game you become it, we become the foundation and the support for for the house yeah. <laughs> you know and it's for me one of the most challenging things to do is is to be the opposite of that sort of flash. Um, sometimes I like to try to be invisible, yeah. just because it's a whole nother level of of uh, sort of penetration to the hearts that are hearing it, you know, from the low end, you know. So I just try to make it as seamless as possible, and and as like fill the room with with this vibration, but it doesn't necessarily, you don't get, um, you're not obstructed by mm-hmm. that. Oh, did you see that cool lick, you know? Which which is fine, you know, but it's fun to be on a gig that there's another focal point, yeah. you know, um, that's not just um, virtuosity. And, yeah. and as we know, you know, bass players, and everybody loves chops, and when you have a room full <laughs> of bass players, everybody comes in with their thumb, Ready, cocked, and loaded. You know, of course. <laughs> and um, and you know, I love that. And it, but for me, you know, making music and 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 seeing if you can get it done without that is is also a big challenge. Because in the acoustic section, it was almost like the way you were playing on your electric was exactly the same 
how you were playing with the acoustic. It was like little deft touches. Yeah. There was nothing like there was. It wasn't that there was no energy in what you were playing. It was. It was more of a. I don't need to do that. Right. I, I'm basically supporting him. Right. Because when he's taking a solo, I'm filling up the bottom end, and that's. Yeah. I mean, this is this very much, um, you know, provide uh, provide room for Eric to to really, you know, yeah. say what he's going to say, you know, okay. and, and without so. Um, he doesn't have to worry about, you know, the, the rhythm section kind of impeding his, mm -hmm. you know, his voice. So how is it different from, because obviously this is a small run of shows and then I think you've got some in New York in October. It's a bit different to the big tours that he did in the 90s. So right. how have things changed? Well, I, I would just say the, the um, this is a, um, it's a more, it's, it's a wiser not more subdued, but it's just, it's more played in, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think those shows still, you know, um, I, I keep likening it to, to like a really good relationship where you're, you know, where you just become more comfortable with, with each other. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it, 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 it becomes, um, so you don't have to do, you know, try to impress or, or anything. You just... You're, you're grateful for the company, mm -hmm. and then you're you're just in it. Yeah, you know, it's not like anything is being forced, or um, it, it's a it's a very cool place to be, especially after all of the incarnations of bands. And, yeah, and, and you know, I go look on YouTube with some of those thirty years ago, and, it, and I mean, and <laughs> again, it's it's at every stage, it's been it's been a thrill, mm. you know. But it's like children when they grow up, you know. Age three is that incredible, it's the cute age, you know, age five, and then you have the teen years, but there's something great about every one of those aspects, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of a, like, you know, growing up, and, and now it's, it's, it seems very grown up, you know. Cool. Okay. Um, how would you describe your bass tone that you, obviously, Eric has good ears, that's why he picks good bass players, good musicians, but the bass tone you have for Eric's stuff, is obviously not quite as maybe hi-fi as you would have with certain other things. Do you, when you're preparing for a bunch of shows with Eric, are you thinking, well, I need to maybe do this on certain tracks and maybe take the treble down a bit and not so many mids? And yeah, I, I um. Or does he just give you like a free reign? Just says, just do your thing. Yeah, I mean, he he just wants it in. There. I mean, after the show the other night, he just said, "Turn up, I want you louder than me." Ah, <laughs> okay. Know? So you know, I, I was. You know, I, is he quite fussy in what he hears from you? Well, he he, he just wants to he wants to hear it and feel it. Yeah. And so um, the uh, the the interesting thing is you're always trying to come up with the balance, the, the correct balance. Mm. But now I know as a leader, um, when I'm playing, what I want to hear. If, you know, you don't want to hear things too loud or or too soft. You know. Yeah. So there's um, there's instincts that you have to use to know. Okay, is this? And so the other night. You know, he. Uh, I said, just let me know. You know, where you, you know how it feels on stage because yeah. it's completely different from rehearsal. Did you have one cab the other night, or have you got two? One. One. Yeah. So what four ten? Yeah, just the four ten. Yeah. Wow. Because I mean, on gigs like this, and any big gigs, is, your your fate is in the hands of yeah. the front of house engineer. <laughs> Very much. You know, so I could I could I could lose the amp completely. Yeah. And it's up to him. And and in the Albert Hall, I think you don't want. Massive volume coming off the stage. Just so yeah. yeah. However, Eric's a crank it naked. Because you know? <laughs> so, uh, it didn't sound like the monitors were particularly loud. And I was no. like trying to see how many cabs you had. I could see the one, saw the head and the tuner. Yeah. And obviously, your setup generally, you're not a huge effects guy. No. Never kind of been that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, it sounds pretty thorough, but <laughs> I'm only seeing one cab. So, all I can yeah. assume is it's coming through what we're hearing. Yeah. But it sounded so comfortable. And you go to some gigs and you think, well, I'll put the earplugs in and then it'll sound a bit more hi-fi. But it, it's not like that. It feels like a comfortable... Was it, was it punchy enough or, or could yeah, he... Yeah. Because he, he's a little shy on the bass sometimes, you know. Could have done with a little more. Yeah. It sounded like the acoustic bass was louder than the electric. Okay. Because you're getting that natural reverb. And there was a yeah. point you hit a note and it went... Yeah, exactly. And I met, you held it and you looked at Eric and it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Afterwards, he said, "Oh, that was lovely." You know? yeah. He likes. He likes. I was looking, look. thinking, "It's one of the." It's Paul Carrick hitting something. And it wasn't Paul Carrick adjusting his hat. But it's you, <laughs> then it can't be anyone else. 
Yeah, no, he he mentioned that after the show, and he, he said, "Oh, that was, that was a lovely vibration." Yeah, yeah. and uh, so I mean, those those things are. But I've always so that said, wasn't planned. It, it, no, no, okay. I mean, kind of. Cool. But you know, you. That's what I love about playing live is that is more, the more things that happen that are, are not planned, yeah. the better yeah. for me, you know, and you know because nobody wants to just sit up there and play a record, you know. No. And, uh, but but I, I've always been sensitive to the fact that anything you hear on a concert from bass is strictly up to the front of house now, yeah. you know, because in your if you're in a club you crank your amp and then that's what they're hearing, mm. but amp has nothing to do really that you know and with these big Madison Square Garden and these kind of places the app is um, you, you could go with or without it's just a big DI box it's just a big DI <laughs> big monitor yeah and um, and I noticed you weren't using in ears do you do no. that with other artists but with Eric you don't or is it just generally you prefer a monitor you know the, um, monitor with live is, is a little more of a real experience so you're not quite in the studio with this Sort of perfect sound, yeah. Um, um, so, depending on the gig and, and and the way that you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, front of house people they would like no monitors on stage. You know, then they could just control but everything. Is this, you prefer to have a monitor, and, uh, but I think a monitor is one less. Um, it, it's one less element, you, you know, because then within ears now you have just the volume, and I do like to hear the ambience of the room. Yeah, you know, just. Uh, and, and sometimes I like to sometimes I like to turn right down and play and see what the bass feels like in sure. the room. Yeah. You know, but I do yeah, I do back off a little of the treble and then just again you know the, the unobtrusive approach at this stage in the game <laughs> with Eric is it feels it feels good yeah. and it feels natural. Yeah. How's your hearing? And uh, what'd you say? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, you won't get that over from me. <laughs> you yeah. got to get up early for that one. Yeah. I mean, how are, how is your hearing? It, it's good. Yeah. yeah. It's good. I I am um, I've managed to, I think, dodge a bullet. I, um, over the years, I, you know, in the really loud days, I did wear ear protection a lot. You know, for there, you know, so he likes it nice and <laughs> in the does, guitar. Yeah. Well, his hearing isn't great. He's had some deafness I, for a while. I think it? so. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. uh, but you know, stand in front of a, a cranked amp it's all your life, yeah. occupational hazards. You know, and I've had some, you know, drum hits where. So I, you know, at nights where I go back to the hotel and then they, wee, this big ringing. In I've the got ears. a little bit of it. I mean, I've worn earplugs for twenty odd years, but I yeah. did a, about a year where I was doing a lot of depping for other bands, and it's one yeah. of those things. You wear earplugs and keyboard players shout, "Can you do the, go go to the court?" And you've missed it because you haven't heard it. So I get rid of the earplugs. Right? What did you say? Yeah. And then you get into a habit of then not wearing them, and right. I've got a little bit of. That yeah, go, so it's no, I, and 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 that's a, actually a good point. I, I should probably check, um, get the hearing checked soon, yeah. you know, just to see. Yeah. But last time I had it checked, it was it was okay. Cool, you know, I felt cool. comfortable. Okay, um, new solo album, Reverence, very good by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you for the download. Um, a very strong groove element on this, and I know there's obviously two Earth, Wind, and Fire covers on there. Right. But it does have even on the songs that aren't. <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire. The very there's a nice Latin track. You yeah. got lots of horns. There's lots of percussion going on. Yeah, and a great bass tone. Usual Yamaha crispness that we kind of associate with it. Did the success of the first album and the film take you by surprise? Because I interviewed you just as that was about to come out, yeah. and we know what happened. <laughs> it just went boom, and you're number one of the album jazz charts for like three years <laughs> you know, it was, it was I mean you were know, you expecting that you know of all these years I don't I've learned not to expect anything and so you become pleasantly surprised yeah if if there's any degree of success beyond um, you know beyond anything so I was I was totally surprised and and, and it felt like you'd kind of unleashed this dog off a lead and it just went Bang! Everywhere. No, it's 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 a uh, it's amazing, and I have to credit you know Yamaha Entertainment Group for really saying okay we're gonna we're gonna try to shoot this out of yeah. a cannon you know and, and they have a they have a very nice sized cannon yeah you know? <laughs> so if you're gonna be you know with a label these days especially where um, they almost they almost uh, 
you know, put as much juice into the appian once the child is born, raising it yeah. as they do, you know, the, the birthing process. Yeah. So it's really, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, I'm with a label that it, it really makes sense having been with the company for, you know, again, 40 years. Almost, yeah, almost they've been coming up on 40 yes. years. <laughs> so as, a, as an endorsee, and then they do a label, and it just, it felt like a really good fit. Did he give you pressure to do the second one? Absolutely, absolutely. Because you don't ever strike me as someone who particularly is going to feel pressure. You are Mr. Cool. You're and my girlfriend well, said, "Where are you going?" I said, "Go to see the King of Cool." She went, "Oh, you're going to see Nathan?" Oh no, I went, yeah. <laughs> um, but Bless it, you know, the first album was such a flyer that to come up not to replicate that, but you know, you've got to come up with the goods. The second album is always it's the sophomore, album. Yeah. sophomore album. Yeah, that's always in the back of your mind. Is Every piece of music you get is, you, you, you don't, you know, because like comparing children, you don't want to really compare children, but at the same time, okay, do, do we have, and, and I, you know, as we got through the project, I, I just started feeling better about the fact that we, you know, are, are in good territory again. Mm. And how long did it take you to pull the material together? Because obviously there's a couple of covers on there, but yeah. then there's the stuff you're writing, so... Was right. that quite a quick process? Did you kind of already, were you already gearing up for the second album before you'd finished the first? You know, we, we, were, um, we were lucky that on the first album we record, we over-recorded, so there were, okay. you know, more than 20 songs. Great. And so there were at least four or five that, uh, no, about three or four that were going to be contenders for this record. And that, that gives you kind of a running start anyway. Yeah. So we decided to, you know, finish those and that was great because Ricky Lawson was on drums, so there was a spirit of yeah. uh, anything that he's on, you know, that spirit is there. And and so we finished those, so that you know that's a that's a nice little chunk. And but uh, the last song um, until we meet again, I wrote right in the studio as I was you know checking the mm -hmm. bass it, it had gone gone down and then sent to Yamaha and they brought it back. And I was just checking it out, playing these chords, <laughs> and then Moogie, my engineer, what is that? I don't know. And he's He's still just recording. recording. <laughs> yeah. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, okay, hey, we cool. got a song out of the deal. Cool. And um, and so, again, you know, Chris Giro, my co-producer, he was, oh, I want to get, I want to get Chick Corea, I want to get, I want to get you know, like the guys on mm -hmm. here too, you know. So, Earth Wind, and Maurice White had just passed, you know. So, um, you know, that was like a a big punch in the gut for me mm -hmm. because the, you know. Anybody who knows me knows how much I revere Earth, Wind, and Fire. Quite, <laughs> you know, quite. So, so uh, the world over, I think. You know, I, I had I have to hold back from doing an album of Earth, Wind, and Fire songs. <laughs> Maybe and, you should. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Jazz interpretation, yeah, exactly, and and Stevie Wonder, you know. Yeah. Where the uh, the well is so deep, the catalog is is so strong, and mm -hmm. and it's such a part of our DNA growing up and everything that it it would be yeah. very easy to. Uh, Did it feel? Having the Earth, Wind and Fire covers on there uh, and, and getting them committed to master. I'll come back to the thing about the tapes disappearing, but getting Serpentine Fire that you'd recorded 25 <laughs> years ago, right. was that sort of, uh, you felt like I need to get this down safe, committed to master because Morris had passed away? You know, Would that have been like an afterthought in the back of your head? Well, it, it really, it really, you, you know how you, you have a, you have a project or a mission in your mind, but this moves it, moves everything out of the way, you know, like yeah. a guy dies, it's like, oh no, you know, like, it's it's really... Uh, and last year was such a huge year. Oh my goodness. You know, Bowie and Prince and oh, Morris. Oh man. And Lewis Johnson went, and just before that, Chris Squire went. and Chris Squire and, and uh, George Michael. And, and Jack I mean, Bruce went a Jack month Bruce, after I saw you last Exactly. Year. When I saw you, which was September 2014, I interviewed Chris Squire in July 2014. Mm. So Jack died a year after I interviewed him, and so did Chris. No. Yeah, it was a bit spooky. I was like, <laughs> my That's bad omen. Really spooky. It was. So but all that, this huge amount of musical genius, if you like, and ability is all kind the, of gone the, in one day. And, and the Prince thing just got me. It was, it was really? like, it's almost unreal. Just wait a second, am I, am yeah. I hearing? I saw Ida Nielsen uh, a couple of weeks ago. She was at the base, at, uh, the base show, and she was still 
like I said a couple of questions and she was starting to well up I said yeah. it's okay I said if, if yeah. you want to have a cry feel free I said, yeah. but I I never met the guy I didn't work for him but I was a huge Prince fan I said and that guy touched my life so you know if you, if you want yeah. to think. well I know we we were uh, I was in the, the film was being honored at the uh, Albuquerque Film Fest um, and the day I flew in when I got off the plane I got the news and then um, we had a clinic that day and uh, Greg Filling Gaines and Steve Ferroni and I were going to play you know trio yeah. and uh, so the first song we did was Purple Rain You're quite right <laughs> it wasn't a dry eye in the house no, people. It, was, it was like yeah such a surprise came out of nowhere although he had been ill the week before but Right. It's such it a huge, it's like Stevie Wonder going, yeah, and, and at 58, yeah. 57. I mean. Yeah, I mean, that's that's nothing, that's a baby. Yeah. And then, it goes to show you how much he, he accomplished while he was here, though. But um, it was, um, so so again, you know, the, the news of Maurice White, it just, it, it it makes you realize that sometimes with all the things that you're intending to do, you better push him up yeah. to the front of the line that's it. Before, uh, before it's too late. Before time yeah. comes to an end. Um, okay, so how much of a thrill was it having Vadine on your album? Oh and Phil goodness. Bailey as well. And obviously there's a connection with Phil Bailey right. because of Easy, Easy Lover. Right. So so, we ju- so it was Phil Collins, Philip Bailey and you wrote Easy Lover. Right. It's not a bad little number to the, come up with, the, is it? Down the, right down the street at, <laughs> yeah. uh, on Goldhawk Road yeah. at the townhouse.